I am going to start now. The team will begin to, we'll let people in as we go. Uh, and I will be reminding people um, a little bit on how we're going to run today. Look, it's the most auspicious of days, isn't it? Maria Montessori's actually 153rd birthday. And uh, as you're here with us today, so there are celebrations taking place all around the world. Uh, some students are celebrating, some children are celebrating schools, training centers, and uh, all of us here today. And in fact, I just uh, finished listening to um, the children of Port Elizabeth Montessori School celebrating um, Maria Montessori's birthday in Cosa. So, and I know that won't be the only language uh, that um, everyone is, is um, lucky enough to uh, express their thanks really to our founder for this incredible work, work that we're still exploring today, work that we know we are just beginning to understand, work that we know takes us all uh, into the realms of mission and service. So um, I'm delighted that, that, that this birthday is going to be celebrated by the AMI talks on the topic of parent engagement. It's certainly worth reflecting on the fact that Maria Montessori's work, although it focused on creating optimal conditions for the healthy development of human beings from the very beginning of life, it also recognized that even from her early work in the slums of Rome and before that, that she felt that in order to create a nurturing place for children, we also needed to take account of the families because the children were born into families, into the culture of those families. And they were with those uh, parents and other family members for uh, longer than they would ever be inside the specific homes, houses, children's houses, infant communities, nidos, elementary schools and erdkinder. And so, she really wanted from the very beginning to make sure that when the children were in the Case dei Bambini, uh, the mothers could go out to work knowing their children were in a good place, knowing that their children were safe and nurtured and cared for, and that the work that they had to do to sustain their families could be done with peace of mind. We know this from many, many sources. Um, in 1904, you will know she became professor of anthropology at the University of Rome. And while there, she published a paper on the influence of family conditions on the intellectual development of school children. We also know that uh, in those very first Case de Bambini, she placed certain social conditions on the parents, which they had to meet if their children were going to be coming into the children's house. And from a conversation that Mario Montessori had with A.S. Neal, we also note that the children attending those first Case de Bambini also began to transform their parents, not only in terms of practical life, going home and being able to do things for themselves and to perhaps do things that the parents hadn't necessarily found so important, like washing hands before they ate and so forth, but also the parents were coming to the teachers and saying, well, my child is now writing and reading and I would really like to be able to do that too. So this symbiotic nurturing is something that I think we must always remember is um, an important thing for us to focus on. So without uh, further ado and with, with uh, my heart brimming with welcome for so many of you here today who've joined us, may I also thank and welcome Eduardo Cuevas. Uh, many of you, of course, have either met or heard of Eduardo. He's a three to six uh, AMI trainer, and he's been that for the last 36 years. Prior to that, he lived and worked with children in many parts of the world and continues to do that. He's experienced many cultures. He's currently domiciled in Canada. And Eduardo, we are so looking forward to engaging you and listening to you on these ideas of parent engagement. So if I may, Eduardo, may I pass over to you and we will be um, really thoughtful about what it is that you're going to be sharing with us. So we're going to go all of us onto black screen and we're going to mute ourselves. I'll do that to myself too. And Eduardo, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Wow. This is such a, a privilege to be here with you and to share my experience or our experience with uh, this very important topic, right? Uh, it's actually crucial that we 
include everyone in this process. Uh, initially, I, I guess I want to just share how this is uh, something that, well, let, let me put on my, my screen. That'll help. Okay. There we go. So we're going to be having this conversation about parent engagement. And I really appreciated that uh, when the AMI communications went out regarding the topic, that it wasn't, you know, they didn't mention the idea of parent education, which is something which uh, that I've been using often. I, I've been talking about parent education programs and so forth. But I realized that as we were conveying to our parents this idea, that somehow the connotation was like we were going to educate them to become parents. And that is not really the purpose of this uh, program. It, it, it's so important to understand because some people, some graduates from Montessori uh, have said, well, I'm not even a parent, so how can I speak to parents? How can I, and they hesitate to, to, to guide a, a session with parents. But that's basically because we're thinking that our approach or what we're intending to do is actually to educate parents or or to create help them become better parents. Well, yes, in a way, but actually what we're trying to do is to convey our understanding of Montessori. And that we're going to do in a much clearer way by actually doing a parent study program. This makes us and puts us at the same level, right? We're all equals here. We're all learning, we're all studying. And now the recent graduate who may not be a parent, him or herself, uh, is, doesn't have to be worried about that. That's not a, that's not of concern because you're not trying to uh, give parenting classes, but you're actually trying to convey your understanding of Montessori and what she was pointing us to with regards to human development. Okay, so I address now my program more as a parent study program, and the goal right? The goal that we have for the program itself is parent engagement. So this is a very big issue right now. Uh, it always has been, but it's sort of out in the, in the front right now, the idea that we have to engage. Any educational process requires encounter, right? A meeting. It can't be just one person talking to the other which is, by the way, one of the reasons why I really don't like working on Zoom, because I can't even see you. It's like I'm talking to a screen. So this is very artificial for me. But I know, and, and I've been told that it still is of value, that people can then take it in their own terms and go back to it and so forth. So I'm doing it very happily. So parent engagement is what we would do. I, I would tell you, and, and again, I, I may change my mind, but I would not do my, pri my parent program if I can avoid it on Zoom. It would always be in person. So that's the priority. I'm sure under the pandemic, we all learned to, to do things differently. But if there is a, a, a choice, a possibility of choosing, then it should always be in person. There's nothing that's going to uh, be better than actually having this physical, uh, physicality, this, this proximity with the person, right? So parent engagement is what we're trying to do here. This is going to create a very special uh, feeling in the school, in the school setting, and your educational efforts. It's going to create a team, right? It's going to bring about this sense of we're working together. No one, no one can actually uh, criticize parents or, or say that parents don't love their children. But 
how many times have we found that what we're doing in the school with the children, parents then are undoing it at home? And certainly not because they want to undo or they want to be contrary, simply because they don't understand what it is we're doing. So if you want a successful program, and I, I say any educational uh, approach must include the parents, must include the community, the parents, the grandparents, you name it. I put here within brackets the idea of a successful Montessori program, but really I believe it's throughout. So the purpose, right? We have a purpose with these encounters and it's, and it's and not only the encounter with the parents, but the encounter with the children, encounters within our, between ourselves as staff members. The purpose is to develop the development of each individual's full potential, right? If you look at the AMI vision and mission statements, this is constantly repeated. And this is because it is central to our work, the full development of each individual. And that goes for the child. So everything we do in the train in the work with the children is for their full development. But it also means for the parents. And the more they understand human development, they themselves will be able to develop more fully. And this also includes the community. And by the community, I mean the school staff, those that work in the school, uh, those that are not the parents, but are maybe family members and so forth. So we're really trying to have a setting, a, a situation, a prepared environment where everyone's full and by full potential is developed. Okay. So that's the purpose behind the program. It's not just geared towards parents, but it has a wider effect. The outcome of the program is peace. Now I know there's a lot of interest in this notion of peace. And we all want peace. But I believe that unless each human being reaches their optimal development, there will not be peace. Okay. There cannot be peace. Because peace will be something that will be, will be reflected from each individual, right? So each individual must be in peace in order for there to be peace in the world, peace in society. And how can each individual be at peace? Well, for some reason, I, my mind goes immediately to the peacefulness we find in the, in the children's house. The moment children are engaged, the moment they focus on something that, that is satisfying them deeply, profoundly, they become very peaceful very quiet, very loving. Montessori says that this stage of normalization or normality is not just something that the child experiences, but that we, the adults, who also encounter and find that which profoundly satisfies our needs, also brings about that same sense of peace, of wholesomeness, of well-being. So, if we're thinking about peace as a universal, you know, it, it implies, in my mind anyway, that all humans have to have the possibility of developing fully according to their natural inclinations. Now, there are two features uh, to the parent study program that we've developed. And of course, I want to emphasize that this is not an AMI uh, program. There are many parent programs out there available, which are just as effective, I'm sure, just as uh, powerful. Uh, let me wait for a moment. Uh, but I want to, to say that this has 
been extremely uh, well received in the different countries I've been able to present it. One of them is this full day workshop, okay? So how did this come about? In our schools in Puerto Rico, and I know that there are several people uh, right now on the Zoom from Puerto Rico, and I greet you as well, as I greet everyone. Uh, it was in Puerto Rico, in our school there, that having done our yearly, monthly meetings with the parents, uh, we would always have evaluations towards the end, especially towards the end of the school year. And we would ask parents to give us their input and what could be improved, what could be, what was of interest, et cetera. And they were all very happy about it and very in, encouraged and inspired. And, and they, of course, encouraged us. But this came up. The most interesting thing was, well, it's good that we now understand towards the end of the school year, we understand what it is you're doing and we have a better idea of Montessori. But had we had a better understanding from the beginning, from day one, from the moment our children began the program, we could have worked more with you. We could have collaborated more. We could have been much more part of the team. It's it's too bad that at the end is now when we get it. We're suggesting a full day workshop at the beginning of the school year. And this for me was sort of, I was, it was a total surprise because I, I really never thought parents would come up with that suggestion. And they were really talking about a nine to four full day workshop where we would then cover and give them a bird's eye view of Montessori from A to Z. And then they would have enough uh, knowledge and understanding of the lingo of, of the vocabulary we're using to then reconnect in our monthly meetings. So that was a big surprise. And that's what we started implementing. The other feature besides a full day workshop is this three tier monthly meetings, okay? And I will go into greater detail into both. I'll start with the full day workshop, okay? So this full day workshop led to a, a title, right? I had to come up with a title, something to identify it with. And this has been the title that we began with uh, because no one was born a parent. I feel that that immediately opened the doors and brought down barriers as to, well, that's a fact. No one was born a parent. So there's no reason to have, uh, uh, to be affronted or feel affronted or, or to feel criticized because, well, we're all becoming, we're all learning to become parents. And this, I think, uh, I want to say that these topics that you choose for your monthly meetings, for your gatherings, you have to study them carefully. So you want them to always be inviting, never to be, uh, to be, to, to promote a sense of safety, a sense of, uh, yeah, you're, this is a safe place. So this is the topic that we chose and you'll hear this come on several times now. The full day program, like I said, was a full day, right? All the way from nine, in the morning to four in the afternoon. Now, you see that there are several breaks, so it's important to have breaks. And depending on your facilities, 10, 15 minutes, it usually is more than enough. Uh, it's always good to have there some tea, coffee, water, juice, something that people can then replenish and uh, move on for the next session, right? The session should be relatively short, uh, no more than an hour, 50 minutes is even better. And uh, the lunch break, as you see, is a 45 minute uh, lunch break. We've done an hour, we've done more than an hour, and we find that parents uh, want to move on. It's not that they 
don't want to share among themselves, but after sharing for a while, there's nothing more to share. They just want to go on with the program. And that has worked very well with us everywhere. So when we did it in Spain or Argentina or Puerto Rico or Canada, we've always seen that 45 minutes seems to be actually more than enough. Now, something interesting as well is that the first, the morning session is, the, the topics I'll be using there, I'll be speaking about there, have nothing to do with Montessori per se, right? It's sort of like setting the ground, creating a, a framework. And one of the topics or the topic I begin with is a sense of education, education for life, right? And I certainly go into the root of the word, educare, and there I'm able to, to bring about this, this marvelous understanding that this actually means to bring out, to draw out from the child, from the person who's being who's going through the process right and that already sets the stage for everything else we're going to talk about because if we're going to approach the child as if the child already is as, as if there's going to be something we need to draw out from the child the implication is that the child brings something right so this will automatically uh destroys the whole notion of the blank page the tabula rasa where there's nothing there i'm going to write on it i'll just form you inform you and then you just copy what i say so that already sets the mood for our exploration for our study uh we then take our break and let, let me say something here <laughs> uh maybe it's a little bit off topic right now but and, and we can certainly talk about it more later. How do we bring the parents to these workshops? But many times, once uh, we begin the session, I encounter some parents and many times fathers, right, who may have felt sort of obliged to be there. Uh, they're just cross-armed and they're, you know, they're sort of like, okay, let's get this over with and ho-hum and I'm here because I have to. Uh, and why the reason I'm saying this is because invariably, and I've given this workshop many, many times, but invariably after the first or the first session, during the first break, you automatically have someone come up. There's always a father mothers as well but a father will come up at least one who will say i had no idea i had no idea that this was what we were going to do uh, th this is exciting this is wonderful are we going to have more so that that alone and that it it's repeated it's a repeated experience every place i've gone uh, has just emphasized the importance of actually offering a full day workshop so after the break, we then do speak a bit about the role of the adult, right? Uh, and again, you may think that is totally strange, but I approach it by uh, using Eric Frum's The Art of Loving, where he talks about four aspects of love, right? And because none of us can accuse parents of not loving their children, my intention here is to unpack this word, this word love. And I, I've been impacted by uh, Eric Frum's understanding of it and his idea that love must have four ingredients. That, that's what I then share with the parents. And again, it's a huge eye opener. You're not trying to convince the parents. You're just simply explaining how you understand it and why it's impacted you. So I proceed later on with a little bit of more philosophy, overall general philosophy about life in general, cognitive learning theories. And we do a very interesting thing for them, especially we do a presentation, right? So I want them to understand, I present a cylinder block and I want them to understand 
how children are going to learn by using this block, right? And I, I make it a sort of a dual activity. I tell them, I want you to take note of everything that calls your attention, of these things that that you you, you see which you, you yeah, it, it surprise you. Why is he going so slow? Why is he constantly looking at the child? And I then, of course, do a mock presentation to a, a, a make-believe child beside me. And then we talk about, once the presentation is done, we then talk about what happened, what they saw. And it's fascinating because, of course, once they see the way we work and how we're going to approach a presentation to the child, we can later relate to that and say, well, this is a little bit what you have to do at home when you're teaching them how to put on their shoes or when you're teaching them how to uh, set the table, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I, I'm, st I'm staying here a little bit just because I want you to understand that this has to be practical. It has to be meaningful to the parents. You cannot give the same lecture you received in the training course, but you have to reword it and place it in the context of parents, of the home environment, and now you've got their attention. Only in the afternoon do I begin with the Montessori topics. And we certainly talk about the human tendencies, spiritual embryo, including absorbent mind and sensitive periods, another break, and then, of course, the four planes of development, which fascinates them, really stirs their mind and their imagination, especially those parents who have more than one child and the children have happen to be in different planes of development. They, they clearly understand things that, that maybe they didn't understand before. So the planes of development, of course, has to be unpacked very carefully and enthusiastically. And of course, that's going to lead, of course, to the prepared environment, how each environment is going to reflect a particular plane of development. Then we have a short period, half an hour, for questions and answers and closure at four o'clock sharp. Now, I can't overemphasize the importance of being sharp. If you say you're going to begin at nine and you're going to end at four, you do that. And at four, even if it's mid-sentence, that conveys to them that you respect their time, that you are aware that they have many other things to do, and this becomes part of the success of the program itself. They can then trust us that we will follow through. Now, there that's the workshop, the full day workshop, usually given in September. We're going to have it here on Labor Day on September 1st, the, 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 the day before children begin working. Uh, but you could actually do it any day that works. It could be a full Saturday. It could be, uh, I've even done it on Sundays. So whenever it works and you can get both parents, mother and father there, that's the time to do it. Then we go to the three tier monthly meetings. Now, this is important because parents who have already heard well, when I'm talking about three tiers, I mean that we have, well, we're going to have encounters with these parents again. The emphasis is encounters. And the first tier is for the parents of the first year, first year parents. So their children have just arrived to Montessori. Their, their children are new, and so are the parents. With them, you're going to have a monthly meeting, okay? once a month. So the first meeting with them would be the, the full day workshop in September. And then in October, you would continue and have another meeting, another in November, and you decide which months, according to your culture and, and where you're located, which months you're going to have a meeting with the parents. Now, this total meeting, this sorry, this monthly meeting uh, should not be more than a two-hour encounter okay maximum and when i say two hours 
uh, it includes the arriving, the mingling, the actual presentation, and then a little bit of time for a question and answer and farewells, all right? No more than two hours. Again, respecting their time. Many of them had had to arrange childcare. Many of them have worked the next day. So this is very important. I can't overemphasize that. In this first month um, uh, meeting for the first tier, we, of course, are going to talk about things their children are doing, like practical life. Here's where you're going to explain, why is my child washing a table? And why is my child washing the same table over and over again? And that seems to be the only thing they're doing, right? When are they going to do math, language, writing, reading, as many parents expect? And here's where you're going to talk about the practical life exercises as indirect preparations for math, for writing, for reading, and the importance of the skills that the child is developing indirectly for these other things. Well, I can't go into great detail. I'm getting overexcited here. So we're going to talk, of course, about the sensorial area, the sensorial materials, and what they're all about and how they influence the child and, and better the child's intelligence because of being able to perceive and refine his senses and continue with the mathematical mind, spoken language, and something that's very interesting, of course, and you may want to work with it early on, is Montessori in the home. How can we translate some of these things home? All right. And I can't go into that here. Uh, another topic, especially I think that in January, when we come back from the holidays, if that's a holiday that's observed in your country, uh, any anytime you begin anew, I feel that the topic of discipline is always of great interest, right? How do we actually help the child behave at home? And, and how do we do this? And of course, we would include it in the context of discipline and freedom. Then we have the second tier, second year parents, parents whose children are now four and five. So the first year were two and a half to three and a half, four. And now you have the four to five-year-olds, right? And with them, one meeting a month is enough. So if you began, let's say, your parent uh, uh, meeting uh, with the first year in September with their uh, full-day workshop, then you could have one meeting in September for your second-year parents. And then you don't have another meeting with them till November. So you skip a month between. Their interest is going to be, of course, Oh, the total of these meetings will be four to five meetings in a school year. Their topics, of course, is this whole social development. Montessori refers to it as a social embryo being, being formed in these ages, in the preschool age. Also of interest to them will be the explosion into writing. And here's where we emphasize the idea. Yes, we do writing before reading. And that is you know, of great interest to them because most of us in traditional did reading before writing. Introduction to math. So finally now the child starts actually working with mathematical material, but it, they will be able to see the connection between all they did prior to what they're going to do now. And then also we need to dwell a little bit more on the second plane child. That child that is not there yet, he's not six to 12, but the child is already pointing in that direction, right? Let's move on and see the third tier. Obviously this will be for the third year parents, a meeting every other month. So we'll alternate with the second tier and the third tier. Their topics of interest, so again, we will have four or five meetings with them. Their topics of interest, of course, are all the sensorial explorations, right? So how do how we go back to this, what we used to call the advanced sensorial material, and how all this actually is, is not just to repeat 
the presentation, but for the child to discover and to be able to see the geometric shapes in the whole world and around him and so forth. Explosion into reading, right? How reading is now of great importance for the child. Mathematics, the passage to abstraction. How are we helping the child work math in the mind? And transitions. What's going to happen once the child leaves the program and moves on to another school, whether it be a Montessori school or not? So this whole program, well, that that covers the, the three-tier monthly program. But we have the workshop, no one, because no one was born a parent, in a four DVD series. Okay. And it is already digitalized, both in English or Spanish. And you can email me here and I can give you information as to how to go about finding that. Or if you want a hard copy, which is, of course, many schools want to have their hard copy, you can directly purchase it from Neenhouse Montessori USA. But at the moment, it is only in English. Okay. So Montessori for all at AOL.com. There are other important considerations, but my time is up. So we may want to talk about pre-parents and how to make the program maybe mandatory. And with that, I say thank you. And I pass it on. Thank you so much, uh, Eduardo. I'm actually fascinated, uh, I hope, in the questions to find out a little bit more also about the four aspects of love that you actually uh, uh, mentioned earlier. That was, uh, <laughs> thank uh, you. I was quite fascinated by that. Um, so now, again, put some questions into the chat if you'd like, and we'll try and make sure we visit some of those as we move forward. But we're going to now move uh, country. We're going to move ourselves into the country of Kenya, and we're going to look at some of the some practical um, actual work with parents on the ground in those uh, in that particular country. So I'm very happy now to introduce to you two speakers sitting side by side with one another, uh, uh, Francesca Kipsoy and Lillian Warimu Mwaura. Uh, they're both going to speak one after the other. I won't interrupt th interrupt them, but they have two slightly different stories that they're going to be telling you. Uh, before they speak, let me just say that Francesca is the program director of the AMI affiliated society Montessori for Kenya. She holds two master's degrees, one in diplomacy and one in social integration. And her special focus has been on the education of minority groups, ethnically diverse groups, refugees, vulnerable groups. Her focus currently is to try and create greater access to Montessori education for a multiple, multi, multiplicity of these groups actually in, in Kenya. And so she will be telling you a little bit about some of that work. And then after uh, uh, Francesca has presented to you, then uh, Lillian is going to also tell you a little bit about her journey with the Corner of Hope. She is currently head of school at Corner of Hope, and she was one of two experienced Montessori teachers who were instrumental from the very beginning in moving into what was an IDP camp, an internally displaced people's camp. She was one of two teachers who moved into that camp and helped them to build what uh, many of you now have heard about in terms of Morning of Hope. And so uh, she holds both the Kenyan National 3 to 6 Diploma and the AMI International 3 to 6 Diploma. So uh, we have a little bit uh, of, um, uh, I would say, technical challenge. So on one of the presentations, you may actually see the presenter's notes. Can you take that as an absolute bonus rather than something that you wish we weren't doing. So <laughs> during the presentations, you will see uh, uh, two presentations. I won't interrupt them, but I will welcome them both. Uh, Francesca and Lillian, thank you very much indeed uh, for being with us. And we'll turn over now um, the, 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 the engagement of parents to you both. Thank you. Um... I am going to begin my presentation. I am Francesca. And um, my work is uh, to support Montessori activities in Kenya. And um, what do we do as uh, uh, Montessori for Kenya? Montessori for Kenya ensures that there's uh, quality assurance, uh, specifically in Montessori developed schools or the ones that have been established in Kenya. And we support that 
um, mentors um, who have been uh, supported through our network to mentor other teachers. We also support professional development uh, in terms of um, exposing teachers to um, international AMI diploma. We also support them with online assistant courses so that they can they, they are accessible as well as other schools who are not specifically under us. We also do network and partnerships to ensure that there's a link between Montessori for Kenya and Montessori um, uh, to the world and also to other countries and to other schools within the country. We're also very much into strategic growth and partnerships and these we have a fully uh, fledged uh, board who is quite, quite diverse and uh, is able to uh, advise uh, on the next steps and uh, where we move uh, in the future. Uh, in 2019, Montessori for Kenya came into, and this is this came into because of uh, a lot of work that it, that had been done in one school called uh, Corner of Hope Montessori that was started in 2010, and uh, the establishment of Montessori for Kenya was to ensure that this outreach of Montessori to other uh, individuals, other schools, and in the future create a Montessori hub that people can come back and uh, be able to work uh, with us. And with me there is Hine Corin, when he was handing over the office after the establishment and set up, uh, setting up of structures, um, where now Montessori for Kenya is. And he was also behind the affiliation to AMI. Um, this was because there was a need for a central body to ensure that Montessori work and Montessori activities are seen and they are able to, uh, to be done in Kenya. Uh, Montessori for Kenya is uh, registered with the NGO board, so we are fully functional uh, with the certificate. And our core activities are we, are, we function as a central bo body. We also support established initiatives that I'm going to talk to you uh, in a bit. We raise awareness about Montessori education. Montessori education has been in Kenya since uh, the, the early 1970s, but a lot of people are not aware of what Montessori education is. And we do this by uh, en engaging individuals, engaging organizations uh, through our website, through our social media, and as well as in calls, uh, people asking about Montessori. We also lobby with the government and uh, we network with other uh, organizations as well and, and, the, and the government. Our networks include uh, government institutions, communities. Uh, in the government institutions, we work with the Ministry of Education very closely, uh, communities uh, in different uh, parts of the country. The diocese, uh, the Catholic diocese of Nakuru was very instrumental when we were setting up our first school, uh, our first model school, Konov Hope. And uh, we also have colleges who have been um, very instrumental in working with us. We also work very closely with global Montessori community. And this includes the trainers that we have as uh, mentors who come to support our teachers and also support our initiatives as we continue to grow Montessori in Kenya. Then there is the biggest aspect from AMI where we seek our, our guidance and we work together very closely and collaborate to ensure that Montessori education is what is Montessori because there's a lot of Montessori but not the real Montessori that is happening elsewhere. In training, uh, we have three Montessori training colleges strategically placed in three regions of Kenya. One is in Mombasa, uh, which is in the which is in the coast. Uh, another one is in Nairobi, which is in the capital city, and another one in Nakuru, which is in the uh, in the northwest. And these colleges work together. We work very closely together to ensure that there is quality of uh, in training and that uh, teachers get uh, also placed in, 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 in schools. And we, we work closely also in terms of uh, examinations because we have centralized exam bodies where the, 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 the tutors come together, they set the exams and it is, um, uh, and, and, and it is shared to all the colleges. Uh, we have the three to six training in the national and uh, uh, diploma level. And in 2000, and, um, uh, 2018, we had the first 27 trainees who did the 6 to 12 elementary training. 
And that gave birth to the first elementary class in Kenya that is situated in Kono of Hope. Because I mentioned earlier that Kono of Hope is a model school that we use to support other schools, individuals and organizations as they set up their own schools. We also, uh, we also support with online orientation courses and uh, material making, which is really a big part of us, is that the teachers make their own materials and they are able to use them uh, uh, using the, the locally available because materials are very expensive. But once the teachers are able to use what is locally available around them, they're able to make materials and it creates a kind of an ownership. They take care of their materials and they're able to repair them wherever they go. It also helps them to move with the materials as I'll, as I'll explain to you in, um, in, in, in some of the slides. Uh, in, a support, in, in supporting the growth of Montessori in Kenya, we support, uh, there are so many Montessori schools now that are growing. And how do we do that is that we support them by using the experienced teachers. We use, uh, we, we uh, recommend them to go to training in, in, in our colleges. We also recommend them to do the online assistant courses so that they are able to get the um, Montessori training. We also support them with the establishment by sending teachers to go and set uh, the classes and verify the materials with them. With the curriculum and training approval, uh, our curriculum for Montessori was approved in Kenya for both training and the curriculum for use in schools. So that means that teachers who train in the Montessori colleges with a diploma, they're able to be employed in public schools as well as private schools. Uh, we also support research uh, and uh, a few uh, last year we were we were in focus groups and we got feedback from the parents. We get feedback from the communities and they give us a lot of information of how Montessori is is working with their children and how also uh, we can improve ourselves because we value feedback. And in some of the feedback that we see is that uh, parents are mentioning that their children are different from the ones who went to the traditional education. And uh, some of them also mentioned, the children themselves mentioned that they are very safe in the Montessori environment and they have changed their communities by changing some of the ways and trying to show their parents what to do. Uh, with teacher capacity, we support training in the different initiatives. We, we support uh, well, as, 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 as well as uh, so ensuring that the teachers are linked to the international AMI course. Uh, for example, there are teachers currently working, uh, studying in Tanzania for the three to six AMI International uh, Diploma. And hopefully next year we'll have another set of 15 teachers doing the elementary training. We're also trying to expand training to all age groups. And this year we started with the 0 to 3 where we engaged communities in Nairobi, Nakuru and Samburu on how we can work together with young mothers as well as young fathers to bring in education and to know themselves and know what Montessori is and how important it is to them. Uh, we do community engagement and uh, this we do by, uh, so that the communities are able to work with us. We explain to them the importance of education. We explain to them the importance of um, sending their children to school, why we train the teachers from their communities and why, the, why Montessori itself because we believe that Montessori education is the best education and it's culturally appropriate to all the children in Kenya. So we do this uh, with, uh, with the support of AMI and other partners. Our initiatives, I'm going to talk to you about our initiatives. One of them is uh, the Kono of Hope where we have 120 teachers. And I think Lillian is going to talk deeply about uh, Kono of Hope. And um, our teachers do a very good job. All these teachers are not at Kono of Hope but they are all over the world, serving and teaching children and uh, changing communities. Another initiative is in Samburu. And from this photo, you can see uh, these are parents who came to school to, uh, to be part of uh, environmental uh, uh, participation. And they came and planted trees and they made sure that they put sticks around the trees so that uh, no wild animals or nobody can bother the tree as they grow. These communities, uh, they are nomadic in, uh, in, in nature and they move from one place to the other. And what we do is, um, what we have done is we have uh, uh, engaged the teachers from the community. Culturally, 
women and their young girls take care of the children. And this is why most girls don't go to school and they get married very early. And uh, from our community engagements, we talk to them about the value of education and some uh, and the teachers, because we train them from the community, they're able to translate and they act as role models as well. So these, these women now release their children to go to school and they live within manyatas, which are um which 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 are in small pockets, but the teachers who have been trained, they move with their materials and they stay in the manyatas. And uh, uh, this is a picture of one of the schools in the manyata. It's very beautiful. The parents also come in uh, to build the fence. They cook for the children, like they make porridge in this in Sambul, particularly they make porridge for the children and they have their breakfast. They have uh, they, they have their snack throughout the day until they go home. They also fetch water for the teachers and uh, they support with the cleaning and also kind of informing the other community members that this is a school and they can bring their children. And uh, as you can see, uh, Montessori is culturally appropriate because one of the teachers is teaching the is telling the children a story. This is part of their culture. They are taught through stories and they learn uh, from the community before they come. And it's very seamless to them because they adapt easily to the education that is done through um, use of materials because they use and they uh, they learn to use uh, material, uh, they learn to use uh, skills. They start learning to use skills as early as they can because they take out children, they fetch water, so they know all those skills. So the teachers use to uh to ensure uh and the children also share them the other stories to the others um this is a, a a nomadic classroom that is a tent and uh it was made in a way such that if the community moves the teachers are able to move with them and they're able to see themselves as part of the as part of the school because if the school is able to move they are uh, they, they feel like they are part of them the children also wear uniform that uh uh, culturally that looks like their culture and they really love it and uh, uh, they're able to come to school every day. Uh, the, the other thing, the other role of the teachers also, because they are the educated ones, is they support with the, uh, with the prescription. From this photo, there's a nurse who comes to school to give, uh, to see uh, the health of the children, to weigh them, to, uh, to measure them because most of them don't get uh, nutrition from an early age. And the work of the teachers is to, in, uh, is to ask the nurses to come. If there's a child who's sick, they alert the, the, the nurses and they come, they're given medication. And because the, the parents are not able to, uh, to give medication or administer them well, they leave, the, they leave them at the school and the, and the teachers also give the children medication because they live within the manyata, they're able to follow them throughout the day. And also um, uh, they, 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 in, uh, they educate the parents on how to administer medication, how to treat wounds and all those things. So the teachers are very instrumental in the communities. And these, uh, this is done through collaborative uh, practices between the, between, the, between the schools, the hospitals, and other, uh, other agencies within the community. Another initiative is in East Pokot. This is a community that is in the North Rift. It's also nomadic in nature. They move around uh, with their animals. They are very traditional. They practice uh, uh, female genital mutilation. They also, um, uh, they, they, they also prone to uh, insecurity because of uh, cattle raids, uh, poverty, low, low, low literacy levels, among so many other issues. Um, the, the expectations of a child in Pokot is to herd and to take care of the young ones. In the two photos is a boy who is herding and there's an elder watching him. And uh, in the other photo is a girl, is a girl with a baby. That is the expectation that every child goes into the social norms. The boys uh, start herding when they are young and later they become orangs and they take care of the security of the community. Uh, the girls take care of the children as they learn to take care of the families. And later, they, uh, they are, they are they, once they go through initiation, they get married and they're able to take care of their families. Unfortunately, they do this when they're very early. Uh, with our engagement, 
we've been able to train teachers who have now brought Montessori into the uh, into the community, and there's a there's a there's there's a positive or there's a future for education in Pokot because now parents are bringing their children. Uh, we do a lot of community awareness on why it is important to do education, and one of the teachers who is standing with the red skirt is actually a Pokot herself who has been trained. Uh, she's Montessori trained. She has both the certificate and the national diploma as well as uh, undertaking the international AMI diploma course in Tanzania. And uh, through these engagements, we talk to the parents on the importance of bringing the, their children to school. We engage them on what they see and uh, what they learn from their children. And some in this particular school that we went to, uh, recently the teacher called and said that for the first time since we engaged the community, we've met them twice, the children have never stopped coming to school. And she has one of the biggest classes. And this is a plus because in other schools by the by the by July, no children are no longer coming to school. But she also says that the children love using the materials, the parents love what the children uh, are doing, and they also give feedback. They also say that their children are different, they are used, they, they, they are taking care of um, the family at home, they are doing unique things that they have uh, that uh, they, they don't know. And this brings in also the aspect of peace because with respect that they do in class, the calmness uh, with how the teachers talk to them, the children are able to re replicate the same thing at home. And it brings a lot of harmony to the families and, and thus in, impacting a whole community. This is another community that we engaged also in Pokot where the only school that was around that village was about uh, seven kilometers away and the children were not able to go to school. And uh, when we talked to them about starting a Montessori school, we brought the teachers that had been trained. They put, they, they took up the initiative and they, and they wanted to build their own school. And they started by bringing, uh, gathering rocks and also building a house for the teachers. Uh, so our opportunities for Montessori for Kenya is that in the future, we continue with the mentorship. We already started mentoring teachers who are, who are from Kenya, who are uh, now spreading uh, Montessori to different communities and to different parts of the country. The, the other thing is that uh, we also support, uh, we also work and network with uh, different stakeholders to ensure that Montessori is um, uh, reaches to each and every community and each and every person and each and every child who deserves it. We also do involvement through communication, uh, awareness, promotions, so that in, everybody knows about Montessori. And this is what I do as um, uh, in, in the Montessori for, in, in, the, in the office of Montessori for Kenya. And I'm going to let Lillian now talk about the Corner of Hope initiative that she, she heads at, uh, um, at, 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 at Corner of Hope. So I'm just going to share the screen. Okay, thank you very much for uh, Francesca. Uh, my name is Lillian and I'm going to talk about uh, a corner of hope. And uh, a corner of hope uh, is, a, is an in initiative uh, to help uh, vulnerable communities, for example, the internal refugees from 2007 post-election violence and over a thousand families live in the camp who fled their original homes and settled in Nakuru. And uh, the situation that we found there then, that is in 2010, the community had trauma, some were in shock, and some had mistrust and disbelief that they were in a new environment to which they were supposed to adapt. Uh, and uh, in 2010, the first meeting was held in the community to seek intervention that can help and change or improve their prevailing situation, such as education for their children. And uh, you can see uh, the situation that was there. You can see the, the tents that were there. And the, behind there, you can see the houses that uh, their, their parents were living in. And so the first meeting was, uh, we did our first meeting uh, uh, to us and to achieve the parent engagement, we had a discussion with AMI and Nakuru team to develop homegrown situation that will be helpful in their situation. 
and education came as a primary need and the parents embraced the idea of building a school. And uh, from there, you can see how the school was built. Uh, the guidance was offered by the local carpenters and the community provided most of the labor. And uh, you can see there the construction on the left side, you can see the roof, how the roof was being made. And the other side, you can see the completed roof. And now they were discussing on how to make the bricks uh, with the expertise, uh, trying to show them how to use the machine. And so there was a immediate need for education before the school was constructed. And you can see uh, children and a teacher in the tent. Those are the tents that we are using as classroom by then. And uh, the immediate need uh, for school so that uh, they can continue with their education. And uh, you can see also the tent over there. Uh, and also the other need that came is training of the teachers. So the potential teachers were identified from the community and AMI supported their training by sponsoring them to join a Montessori college. Here they made their own materials for use in the environment we had then. And the environment we had then were the tents. That is what we were using. And so uh, we also, con we, uh, after the, the school was constructed, we also continued having parents meeting so that we will be able to explain them about the Montessori materials, that Montessori materials are hands-on materials that can be touched uh, and uh, can be seen. And uh, you can see in the classroom where the various activities going on and you can see the teachers guiding them. And uh, that is where we go to the role of the teacher. And the role of the teacher is to support the, the community in the importance of education. And uh, also the parents also got involved in also making the uniforms for their children. You can see some of the parents are still uh, are doing, are making the uniforms and you can also see the complete uh, uniforms over there. And uh, also parents would volunteer in cleaning uh, the compound and also washing the latrines. And also there were other, uh, there were other refugees that had gone to another place that we call Kisima and they're, they're there, uh, they, they also ask for a school similar to the one uh, in New Canaan, that is Corner of Hope. And the teachers also were trained from that camp. And uh, you can see we also have uh, uh, the feeding pro pro program where the children get their meals in school. And uh, from there, we, we also have uh, challenges that is despite the children coming to school they also face challenges at home that is uh, basic needs not met by due to poverty maybe a child comes to school and uh, have not taken anything since in the morning has not had breakfast and that is why we have the feeding program in school so that the child can uh, take porridge in the morning and we also have lunch for them and also the we also have the drug and alcoholism due to depression and mental illness, where maybe the child goes home in the evening, the child will sleep uh, alone in the house because the parents didn't come back uh, after they had gone maybe to take alcohol or and maybe some drugs. And so because um, there are those presentations that we have done uh, for practical life, maybe a child will, would want to come the next day clean and uh, because they know how to wash their clothes, they would wash their uniforms, but in the morning, they will come and tell you, teacher, my clothes are not, are not yet, uh, have not yet dried. And we also have uh, extra uniforms where we give them. And also, we are, there are marital problems where there is single parenthood and the early marriages where there, you see the, the, most of the children maybe come to school. That is maybe because uh, they, they have not taken anything. Uh, their, their parents are in depression and there are so many things going on and that also leads to also child abuse and uh, also we also have uh, our elementary class we've started uh, and it was due to demand of the community or continuity by the IDPs you can see there the children are uh, in that class and also it was important for the parent to engage so that they may feel self-worth and also be part of their children's journey. 
this is the school after it was completed. You can see over there. And uh, we also have another picture of the, the, the aerial view of the school. Okay, the children have become a change to the community by educating their parents. And this has become a circle of community engagement as mentioned by Eduardo earlier. This is a recent photo of the school outside there. You can see it from there. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, at least uh, you've seen how now Kono Pop is now. So it was a journey and it was a journey with uh, the parents and the teachers. And uh, at the end, the, the child is able to get that uh, education and be educated as a whole. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Lillian and uh, Francesca, for giving us a whirlwind tour of the incredible amount of engagement that you've managed to do in the community and all of the different things that uh, uh, the parents are involved in and the children are involved in in getting the parents um, uh, perhaps to feel more more at ease in themselves as well. So uh, I think that was really lovely. A lot of people are asking us if we have um, uh, will we have we recorded? Yes, the recordings will be available, so you'll be able to to look at these things and and uh, and uh, think about the the, the various uh, questions that you might have. Um, now, um, there's a lot of questions that have come in. I'm going to just ask a few of them. Uh, uh, but thank you very very much, uh, Eduardo. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Lillian, for sharing these very different perspectives that you have and and uh, and and helping us to think and reflect on what it is that we'd like to do. So now um, there's a few questions that uh, I, I wonder. Um, I'm going to ask some for, that uh, relate to Eduardo's presentation and some that relate to yours, uh, uh, Francesca, and some that relate to yours, Lillian. So perhaps uh, um, I can start, Eduardo, with, with yours. Um, that a couple of questions. One is, um, have you done any research findings or any research at all from the studies that you've been doing and the work that you've been doing with parents? And at the same time, could you uh, let us know um, a little bit about um, Eric Fromm and, and, and uh, uh, the art of loving? Okay. Uh, research as such, no, I haven't done. I think it's an interesting thing to, to actually, uh, yeah, engage in. The other topic about uh, the art of loving by Eric Frum, what I found to be very relevant is that it's, uh, someone mentioned in, in her chat, the idea that, of course, love is an action. But it, and and most of the time, especially when I began as a young man, uh, you know, love was basically an emotion, right? And we certainly valued that emotional aspect of of love as well. But when when I read from Eric from and he identified these four things, he says there has to be care, there has to be respect, there has to be responsibility. And of course, there has to be knowledge. These are the four elements that he says are the ingredients of love. And if any of these are missing, then you really can't talk about love as fulfilled, right? So of course, I use it in a context of parenting. So when I'm talking about, well, if a parent says they love their child, but they bring their child, you know, uh, disheveled uh, the next day in the morning and and the child is not cared for it well then i have a question there what do, what do, what does your love mean right so that's that's where the care comes in also the idea of respecting right and the the idea of respecting as acceptance that the child has to be accepted as an individual right and that for me is, is extremely important and, and speaks to how we approach the different children in the environment. And the idea of responsibility, I usually change the order of the word, ability to respond. So responsibility, ability to respond. And this I, I counterpoint with reacting. So parents really uh, connect with that when I say, well, it's responding, not reacting. And what's the difference? You must understand that in the workshop it's a very dynamic 
So it's not just me talking to them, I'm actually engaging them and asking them these questions. So what's the difference between reacting and responding? What's the difference between respecting or what is respecting and so forth? And finally, knowledge. And as, all we, as we all know, it's all based on observation, on ob observing the individual and getting to know the individual, especially the changing individual. So basically, the book is, is still available. I'm sure it's a classic. It's, it's a very small book to read, but very, very powerful. Thank you. And Eduardo, um, uh, there are some questions yet uh, just coming up now as you're speaking, just to say, where can they have access to the program? I know you did mention that. Could you just mention that again for us? We'll sure. sure. The, the, uh, the workshop itself is, is uh, taped. On, on DVD and it's not digital or hard copy. And you can email me at uh, Montessori4, the number four. Oh, no, no, sorry. Montessori for all, right? F O R A L L at AOL.com. Montessori for all. Thank you. There was a question. I don't know if, if I can just say this yeah. regarding mandatory. And mm. someone asked, would, when you say mandatory, do you mean that your program is mandatory? And I have to say yes. So when our parents, when people come to our school, because it was a private school, or even our lab school here in Vancouver, if people wanted to join our project, our school, they were also co-signing to commit to the parent program. So they were expected to participate. And not just moms but moms and dad. That's why I mentioned that, yes, sometimes fathers ap appear there on the, on the workshop totally sort of upset and annoyed and let's get over this. And then by the first break, they're totally engaged and fascinated. So sometimes I think we have to, uh, like when, with, when, when there comes a moment when you don't really invite a child to do something. You say, yes, today we're going to do it. <laughs> and because you know that at this moment, the child needs to discover what that what this is. So yeah, mandatory, if, if at all possible, yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, one one other question, and then I'll move on to, to Francesca. Um, someone has also said, what do you think uh, the role of parents uh, are is in influencing a community's perception of education and a broader acknowledgement of Montessori. Do you see parents having a role there? Well, invariably, and again, I think this is, I, I really appreciate that question because many times schools uh, see parents as clients and certainly there is, a, there is an aspect to that. But, uh, well, let me stay with that because when you see parents as clients, then of course you want to satisfy your clients. And now you have suddenly parents telling you what to do, how to do this, this, or this party, how to, and suddenly now parents are the ones dictating the Montessori program. Uh, in our case, we were very clear that we were going to do it in a, what we understood to be a Montessori way. And this was our contribution to the parents. Uh, by giving them this understanding of Montessori. So once parents understood what we were offering, they weren't then asking for, oh, the other school is offering uh, second languages and they're offering uh, yoga and, and judo and this and that, and you, you don't do that. But when they understood that we were offering this program for them to understand, they were the, by word of mouth, they completely were the ones who, influence the community. We had input of many other people coming into our program that were committed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. A uh, lot of questions coming in, so I'm having to pick and choose. So you you can be happy or sad with me, but I'm going to pick a couple now for, for you, Francesca, that are coming in. There's a lot of questions about the, the nature of uh, nomadic communities, their culture, and um, the way in which uh, the, the work is, is uh, um, uh, helpful. Um, so I'm going to ask you a couple, if I may, uh, Francesca. So uh, one of the questions that we have is um, uh, when you have um, people that are moving on from different different um, uh, from place to place, does does that mean that your um, materials have to be reduced, or do you, can you still offer all of the materials? And secondly, to that, from someone else. Um, 
do you offer the same materials as you would see in any other uh, environment in terms of practical life or is the practical life uh, relative to the to the culture that the children are in okay um thank you for the questions uh when we train the teachers we train them from the community and most of the time they are very much uh, used to the culture and the life of their communities so when they're moving or uh, when, when, the, when the communities move as well the teachers uh, can move with their materials. And in training, we make sure that they make the full set of materials that are used anywhere in the world. So the children are exposed to the same materials that are used, but some of them are culturally appropriate. For example, in Pokot, they use their, um, their mugs on their left hand. And when we started working with, um, with the teachers, they went ahead and they made their own, uh, some parents brought um, mugs that the children used and they used it very easily. I cannot use it, but they use it very easily. So, so the materials are actually culturally appropriate because as I mentioned earlier, children learn lifelong skills a long time ago before they come to school. And once they come to school, they're able to perfect them uh, through the guidance of the teachers. And when they go back home, they're also able to show their parents uh, what they have learned and uh, they're able to use the skills that they have learned through that guidance. Uh, the other thing that um, is, is, uh, is impacted them, of course, is culture. You cannot remove the culture of a person if they are not educated or they are not exposed. And some of the, some, some, uh, most of the time when you bring in the teachers from these communities, maybe they have never experienced some of the things that we've experienced, even as simple as seeing a road. So when they do come, uh, to other communities and they learn to live with other people. Uh, they, they start to learn the training and some of the virtues that are taught in the Montessori education is our, and training is the respect, love, grace and courtesy. And in the Pokot community, for example, the grace and courtesy does not exist. And so when the teachers come, the first thing they tell you is, ah, oh, I've learned how to say thank you. I'm sorry, excuse me, can I, can I, um, can I wait for you? Can I use this? So when they go back to their communities, they're able to spread that. And, they, and the whole community changes because of the little exposure that you give to one person. They go and show it to the children. And this becomes a whole different community, uh, also with the different interactions that they go through. Uh, so they respond to the materials. And once they are done, uh, we work with uh, uh, public schools as well who have taken the children from, from the schools that, uh, that you have set up. And from this, uh, they have come back to request us, how do we use these materials for our children? And uh, you find that some, of, that some of the times the teachers are tasked to support the older children by open, opening up the maturity classroom where they come and practice, especially mathematics and language, because that is one of the lowest in the and, uh, resourced communities mathematics and literacy, that some children could be in higher grades, but they don't know how to read or too simple mathematics. So the, the teachers also become a change and they support other teachers in the communities, not training them, but they take the children, they come and they, and they go through the materials together and they go back to their teachers. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of questions and asking how do we bring Montessori to our schools? Unfortunately, we are now moving in and working with public schools uh, in these communities where uh, there's a lot of impact and even the government, uh, the Ministry of Education is requesting us to train their other teachers and to bring in this beautiful education to all the children in these communities. So this is how we've been able to impact small and slowly growing and impacting a whole community. Thank you, Francesca. And you managed to answer a few more questions that were in the chat without me asking them. So that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Lillian, coming to you, if I may. Um, there's been some very interesting questions um, in the chat, really asking you, you know, how, given that the children uh, um, came out of a very traumatized environment um, for very good reasons. And so when they're uh, outside in their homes and and experiencing some of these uh, stresses and strains, um, do you? How do you find the children cope when they come into the school? Does the school play a role in helping 
um, you know, tell, can you tell us a little bit, uh, somebody used the word normalized, but I think what they meant was uh, calm, happy, um, orderly, content, and so forth. So um, could you tell us a little bit about that and the role that the school played? Yes, thank you, Lynn, for that question. Uh, at the beginning, when we were starting, uh, you remember the children were traumatized, but uh, uh, what we did is that uh, slowly and slowly we started imp uh, impacting the peace with the children. And uh, if they had fear, you will, you, will, you will journey with them, you will give guidance, you will give counseling. And uh, we, ha we had a, a, a very good team that we would we were the older children were the ones who are affected more and the younger so we we would have give we give we gave guidance to the older children on how to cope how to behave how to talk and how to adapt to the new environment so that the little ones would adapt and slowly by slowly it came to adapt and they all calmed down and even the environment itself uh, calmed the children mm -hmm. and so um uh, how how did they how did the parents see the school in 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 terms of what it offered the children? Yeah, uh, at the at first the parents came and uh, they, they said that uh, you I don't know what has happened to our children, but immediately they started coming to our school. Uh, most of the children have stopped crying. Uh, they, they they started looking things in a different way. And uh, the, the the parents embrace the education because they they see there was something different that was happening to their children, and that is how the children started changing. Even the ones that were were, were, were little at home, so the change started from school even and even towards home. Mm -hmm. And and um, thank you for thank you for that. And and when you started, uh, did you have a whole set of materials, or did you start just with the practical life with the children? What was what what was your sort of early experiences there? Yeah, uh, we started with the practical life activities. Remember, they now had a new place to adapt with, and uh, uh, remember they they've come from a new area. So practical life was important because maybe the, the, the things they were using then are now, they are now intense, and intense. The, the, even the sweeping is different because their the, the house have not been cemented. So there's difference in where they are. So practical life was much, much introduced. And that is how, how, how it went. And, and, intro, and we also went to the other ones of education and educating now the senses, but practical life was very, very important at start like washing hands, taking care of yourself uh, with the little place, how to, to, to order of the environment, the environment they had, how to do things because now they had smaller environments. So it was now another way of introducing things. So it was very, very important and it was also helpful. Uh, because the, uh, the parents notice that when the children come home, they are, they are keeping things orderly. They, they, are, uh, they, are, they are folding clothes, they are washing utensils. So it was very, very important for practical life to be introduced at the early stages. Thank you so much. Look, I'm very sorry to have to say to you all that we are going to have to draw to a close on, on this um, uh, meeting that we're all having together. And especially as Eduardo did point out to us all that we must be consequent about the timing that we we, we give everyone to that they need to put aside. Um, first of all, on, on uh, AMI's behalf, but I'm sure on the behalf of all of the people that, are, that have uh, attended today, can we thank the three of you for spending the time to share these incredible beautiful things that you're doing for parents, for children, and for all of us, just, just enhancing the work that, that is done. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of us all. But I also, on this um, day of Montessori's birthday, want to thank each and every one of you because you're all doing this work. It's a movement. It's a social movement that we have going here. And it's only at moments like this when we can come together that we feel the power of what a few people are doing. And then if we multiply it by all of you, we know that there is something really good happening in the world. And I think Maria Montessori herself on her 153rd birthday would be really uh, extraordinarily proud of this movement that has grown from one person. And as I say so often, you know, we think that uh, can one person make a difference? Well, uh, that's all whoever has. So if you are that person, and I know that you all are, uh, I really wish you uh, a wonderful work. I wish you joy and happiness. 
uh, be kind, be kind to yourselves, be kind to one another and connect with one another. Make this movement really powerful because it speaks for children, it upholds parents and it changes communities.